Welcome to this episode of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I am your host, Olga Peters, and if you are new to this show, you can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, as well as Brattleboro Community Television, our Facebook page, and Emily Kornheiser's YouTube channel. I want to welcome to this week's show, of course, regular contributor Emily Kornheiser, who is one of three representatives for the town of Brattleboro. Hello, Emily. Good morning, Olga. And I also want to represent, uh, welcome to the show, Sarah Copeland uh, Hansas, who is a Democrat out of or who represents the Orange Two District, and she is also the chair of the House Committee on Government Operations. We are talking today big topic for many people, we are talking about the state pension system. For those who may not know, um, this has been an issue the state has been grappling with for a long time. I mean, we're talking decades, if I understand it correctly, that the pension system has been underfunded. And so that is the system that um, pays pensions to teachers and uh, state employees. Recently, at the end of March, the House had put forward a proposal to, to rectify the situation and to pay down some of the unfunded liability, which I believe, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Emily and Sarah, is about, what, 5.7 million? Or I mean, 5.7 billion? Yes. Give or take. Ouch. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and <a> challenge. <laughs> yes. This and and it's a problem that's been growing. We have to be fair to the current legislator legislatures that this is a problem that's been growing for decades. So many of the people who are trying to fix the problem are not the ones who necessarily caused it. Um, the proposal, unfortunately, was very unpopular amongst many many people. And last week the Speaker of the House announced that they were dropping it and starting a task force to look at the the systemic issue and and see if they could find other solutions. Which leads me to, Emily and Sarah, where are we now? Well, what I'd first like to say um, is that, and we're going to go into all of this in a lot more depth, that's why we're here today, but one, um, I don't think that the Speaker announced that we were dropping anything. I think the decision was that the original proposal that government operations was beginning to discuss was looking at both funding and governance. And we are focusing just on governance this session with the task force um, being planned to look at issues of funding and financial liability. But the governance is a big part of the challenge, which points me to the other thing that's like a minor correction in your introduction, which is that none of this um, can sit entirely on the current legislature, but certainly not even the past legislature because the pension system is not actually governed by the legislature. It's governed by a series of committees that union leadership sits on, that the administration sits on, and that traditionally legislators don't sit on. And so, That is a big part of what we're going to be unpacking today is how the governance um, led to some of the liability and how we want to sort of step back from that. So um, I'm re-level setting your level setting, if that's okay. Okay. Well, you you are, but I'm going to push back on that just a little bit because while you're, you're right, the legislature doesn't necessarily deal with the pension system, it is the one who's charged with fixing it on many levels. And so the buck is still stopping with you, even if you're not the one sitting on the committees that you just mentioned. Um, and so I am going to push back on, on what you just said just a little bit, because I think whether or not, uh, you know, and you're the ones the people are going to turn to for help in fixing this as well. So sorry, I am putting it back in your laps a little bit. <laughs> no, and I'm... Um... I think that's what this conversation is all about, is that we're trying to take responsibility for a problem that we did not necessarily cause, but that we very much see the challenges in and the need for a solution about, so. Well put. Thank you. So um, Sarah, just for folks who maybe haven't been paying attention to this because they don't have a pension um, in in the system, 
what were some of the key points of the original proposal? Just so we have a kind of baseline. So the original proposal was really aimed at um, trying to trying to level set the employee contribution um, and also uh, trim some of the benefits so that there is a little more money coming into the system, a little less money going out in the term in terms of um, payments to future retirees. And again, all of this was um, you know very very carefully uh, laid out not to impact people who are currently retired or within five years of retirement. Um, and the reason we needed to look at both bringing more money in and sending less out is because we've seen this uh, unfunded liability growing year after year. And we've seen the governance structure that we have in place really um, missing the mark, both in terms of predicting what uh, what the investment returns would be, um, because what you do when you're creating a public pension, I mean, since we're, since we're stepping back and, you know, and, and describing this, uh, this monster uh, for people who maybe aren't tuned into what the pension system is, you know, the, the best uh, functioning pension systems uh, will bring in employer contributions, employee contributions, and put them in a big pot of money, invest that money over time, and you you grow the pot of money. And so part of the benefit that you're paying out to future retirees is paid for by those investment returns so that it takes the pressure off of the employee and the employer to, to be straight writing a check to all those people who are in retirement. The problem that we uh, have uncovered as we've really been trying to figure out where, you know, how did we get in such dire straits uh, is that the, the pension governance structure has been missing its predictions for a number of years without any real correction. And so the governance boards will, uh, will need to project, you know, how many people are going to retire, what's their final salary going to be, so what's their benefit, um, how long will those people live in retirement, are they going to live 10 years in retirement or 30 years in retirement. So all of those sort of experience side of things is uh, is the job part of the job of the governance uh, boards, but the other part of the job is to say how much do we think we're going to bring in <clears throat> in terms of investment returns, and so if you if you underestimate the costs on the benefit side and you overestimate the returns on the investment side, then you get to this situation where we have a growing deficit each year, and that's what we're observing right now. That's, that's really what brings us to this critical point is that this, this very large ship has been heading in the wrong direction uh, for quite some time. And uh, if we want the benefit to be there for future retirees, we need to put the pensions on a path towards sustainability. Mm -hmm. And so the, I think that, you know, multi-billion dollar number feels a little bit imaginary to people. And so I'd love to, and it is a little bit imaginary because it's really, um, it's talking about what's sort of not available in to pay people who might not have even retired yet. So it is a little bit imaginary in that way because we're talking about a system that needs to work across 50 years minimum. Um, but some of the sort of tangible non-imaginary parts of it are as um, the liability goes up, the amount that the state needs to pay in on behalf of the system goes up and up. Um, and not just sort of a normal curve of growth, but in fact, well beyond a curve of growth. Um, and so it takes up a larger and larger share of the general fund. And we've spent years on this show talking about all of the other things we want to pay for out of the general fund. And not that we don't want to pay for pensions out of the general fund, that's a very important obligation of the state, but that there are so many other places in our community that we also have need. And so as it takes up a greater and greater share rather than just a normal um, growth curve, it becomes more and more of a liability for all of the other things we're funding through the state. The other thing is as the pot gets smaller, we're, um, and this is a little bit over my head, but as the pot gets smaller, the investment decisions that we're able to make become narrower and narrower. 
Mm-hmm. And we're less likely to have good returns because we have to be more and more conservative because we have a smaller pot of money to work with. And so those are sort of two of the more tangible things. Um, taking one step further into sort of imaginary money, um, the size of our liability also affects the way we're perceived by outside financial sources. So say our, you know, our bond ratings or Moody's ratings, which are all like, you know, capitalist imagination, but they have huge they real do. impact for us. It's yeah, a real, real, real live financial impact. Yeah. The municipalities need to borrow money to do a, a, a building project or an infrastructure project. When the state of Vermont's bond rating goes down, it costs us more money to uh, costs our towns more money to borrow. And so, you know, that's that's where the imaginary um, uh, money becomes more real to us as taxpayers. Mm-hmm. Emily, I just want to clarify um, what you just said when you when you refer to the pot of money. Are you talking? the pot of money in the general fund or the pot of money in the investments? The pot of money in the pension fund, which is separate from the general fund. Yeah, because the general fund is just something that sort of exists year by year and doesn't get invested, it's just sort of what's spent. But the pension fund is sitting there for that investing in order to grow the pot to pay out to retirees. And just again, making sure my brain is in the right place, part of what the state, when you talked about the state needing to pay more in, what the state has to do is not only does it need to pay what currently current needs are, it also needs to pay catch up money. And that's partly why that share that the state's putting in is is growing. Am I understanding that correctly? Exactly. Thank you. So can I, oh, sorry, go ahead. The other thing that Sarah mentioned, which um, I think is a really interesting thing for Vermonters to think about, um, is when we talk about those actuarial assumptions and how our pension systems were originally built, um, we imagine that people weren't going to live as long as they do now. (laughs) And I'm really, really happy that people are living long, healthy lives. That's great. That's like pretty much what we've been aiming for over the last 150 years with our medical care system. And, you know, that's so much of what we do is for people to live long, healthy, vibrant lives. But it means that people are collecting on the pension more and more. And teachers especially, um, but state employees too, are in a demographic that lives longer than anyone else in the entire country. That's mostly white college educated women. And so we're actually seeing people being on pensions longer than they were ever working, which is incredible and beautiful. And I hope that for my own life, but it upends the way the system was designed when it was designed originally. Mm -hmm. Well, what I find so interesting, just as someone who is sitting back and and watching this from, you know, a 60,000 foot view is this issue for me connects to so many other issues in our, our society in that, you know, quite often Vermont, we hear the, the narrative that Vermont has a, a workforce issue. We don't have enough workers, which to a point is true, but the flip side is that, do we have a job force issue? And are people receiving enough in wages? Are people receiving enough in benefits to actually live that long, vibrant life that Emily is talking about? And something like a pension is a huge part of that for many people. And as, as Emily mentioned, the demographic of, of women, women so often have lower wages than their male counterparts. They live longer. So their risk of poverty and aging in poverty tends to be higher than their male counterparts as well. So again, these pensions play a huge role in someone's well-being. Um, and for me, it's just so interesting that how that intersects with so many other issues that we're trying to correct in, in Vermont as a, as a whole. Sarah, we've been talking for a bit. What would you like to add at this point? <laughs> um, so I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity to, to sort of step back and look at the big picture. And I think one of the other um, big picture talking points that people often hear about is that this problem was created by the legislature. 
And so I want to unpack that a little bit because I want to take ownership, even though it wasn't me sitting in the seat that I am now um, when some of these decisions were made. Um, but we've been trying to unpack that a lot, really um, out of um, a, a strong desire to make sure that we're sort of fairly uh, assessing the responsibility for how we got to where we are. And so we already talked about part of the problem is that we have this governing, these governing boards that, you know, have been painting a rosy picture about investment returns that have fallen short and uh, an optimistic picture about maybe people not drawing as high a benefit or not living as long in retirement, which has created uh, the imbalance on the benefit side. Um, but, but part of the problem that we're looking at now is also due to um, underfunding in the past. In the 80s and 90s, when the pension fund was, was getting much higher investment returns and was much more closely fully funded, you know, 90% funded, 98% funded, et cetera. Um, the general fund at that time, you know, under both, I think the Dean administration and the Douglas administration didn't fully fund our part of the, um, of the pension system. And so this was, you know, this was 20, 30 years ago. And if you had invested all of that money that I think, I think if we total it up, Emily, you may remember the number as well. I think if we total up the amounts, you know, a couple million here and a couple million there over the course of 15 or 20 years, it totals about 168, $170 million. And if that money had been in there way back when and had been growing with the investments over time, um, depending on how you calculate it, um, you know, that would account for between a third and a half of this unfunded liability that we're looking at right now. So sins of the past is real, but it's only between a third and a half of the problem of, of where we are now. And the rest of the problem is the math uh, exercise that we've been trying to unpack over the last um, several months. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of that, you know, we've talked about with, uh, with investment returns and uh, and so depending on how you assess, uh, you know, what, what our actual investment returns should be, uh, we're looking at a situation that's just sort of a basic math problem. Have, are, we, are we as the employer and the employee paying into a pension system that is built to cover people who are gonna live into their 90s? And as Emily said, maybe live as long or longer in retirement than they ever paid into the system as workers. And so that's just a simple math problem. And that's where we get into the conversation about, you know, it, would it be prudent to have a higher employee contribution? Would it be prudent to change some of the way the benefit is structured? And that's the, that's the conversation that we're pushing off to the task force that we still have to create because the legislature in my committee you know, draws the, the short straw on this one. We have to build the task force um, that will consider whether our benefits are, are built appropriately. Um, and we're also going to do some work on changing the governance structure. And, and that's really, um, that is, that's the action item that, that is before us right now over the next couple of weeks in, in this legislative session is looking at that governance structure, trying to trying to invigorate it so that there's more expertise and um, you know, fresh perspectives, people who actually have you know, professional investment experience giving advice to folks who are you know, beneficiaries of the system so that they're working in collaboration, <clears throat> excuse me, to, you know, to maintain a, a pension system that will be there for the long haul. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, don't want to be too stuck on this topic, but as I've talked to constituents and union leadership about this issue, um, I really want to highlight over and over again that union representation sits on those governance boards. And I want to highlight it over and over again because the tenor of this conversation has gotten incredibly divisive. Mm -hmm. And well, everything is, I mean, it's the worst timing ever to be having a divisive conversation, right? Like, you know, Someone gave me the finger on the highway this morning. We're all feeling a little extra reactive and a little, you know, like we're all taking on more responsibility than we possibly can. 
um, in a higher risk environment than any of us have ever lived in before with the exception of um, some people in their 90s. And what that means is that there's a lot of finger pointing right now. And there's not a lot of space in any of our lives for complexity. And what Sarah and I are unpacking here is that like, it's not just like one finger to point. There's like six factors that all added up to all of this, like <laughs> this, right? And the um, and so when people say you, the legislature, even you, the past legislature, it's really missing the point that we've like the administration, the legislature, and the unions have really all been at this table together for decades, not doing a good enough job together. Um, and some of the folks, and there's a lot of sort of competing priorities. So some of the folks on the board might have a vested interest in keeping the numbers in a certain way because they know what that will do short term. Um, and that creates a really big challenge long term. And so I think a lot of the governance challenges, and Sarah, you really did draw the short straw and thank you very much for that, um, is to really like put in appropriate um, incentives in place so that people aren't making the kinds of short-term decisions in order to please their constituencies that are going to have really terrible long-term effects for those constituencies. Mm -hmm. Well said. We have just about five minutes before we need to go to break. Um, thank you, Emily. That was, that was um, really wonderful. Sarah, are there any other concepts you want to or points you wanna leave listeners with before we, we go to a quick break? Well, I think it might be a good idea if we can do a screen share to really show sort of the trend over time. And, um, you know, people are asking why now, what, you know, what is the challenge right now? And so what I'm, what I'm showing you right now is on the state employees system side, and you'll see the blue contribution is the contribution that employees make. Um, so it's growing slowly over time. You can see going from 31 million to 39 million over the four years between 2016 and 2020. Um, and in an, as I said earlier, in a uh, well-structured, well-funded retirement system, you would have roughly equal um, employer-employee contributions, and those would go into a fund, and the investment proceeds would, uh, would help to pay for future benefit growth. But what we're seeing here is because we have not been able to rely on, uh, on really good investment returns, just sort of the nature of the beast since the Great Recession um, of 2008-2009 era, but also because of some of those uh, unfortunate decisions that were made at the governance level, the, the bill to fill the hole comes to the state general fund. And so this is just the state employee side. We can look at the teacher side in a moment, but you know, in 2016, our bill was $50 million. And in 2020, our bill was $115 million. And indeed, since then, um, it has gone up another $30 million uh, beyond that. And so we're, we are looking at, um, at you know, the, the general fund essentially being asked to write a blank check and, and we don't know how much it's gonna grow over time. Um, and so if we can flip to the teacher system, I think that would be a good idea for us to look at that as well, just so people can understand the, the trend and the magnitude of what the general fund is being asked to do. And as Olga, you switch slides. Um, this this is a happy hour first here. We're doing yeah. <laughs> a big breakthrough for us. Um, one piece I'd like to highlight is that the general fund isn't the legislature's money. Um, it's the money that we essentially, you know, work with the governor. The governor proposes a budget. We then um, sort of review, shift, vote up and down that budget. But more importantly, it's, you know, it's money that's used to provide services for all Vermonters um, and government for all Vermonters. It's not the legislature's money. It's certainly not my money. Um, it's money that we use to make the state of Vermont work. And I think that's really an important piece of all of this in the finger pointing um, arena. 
So looking at this graph, you can see that the, the yellow bar relative to the green bar here is even a greater contrast. Um, and that's because the teacher's retirement system has been, um, has, has had bigger uh, challenges over time. Um, and so the, the state contribution is larger relative to the employee contribution. And, and you'll see the employee contribution is growing slowly over time, but not growing anywhere near the rate at which the state required contribution is growing. And so that's the trend that we're trying to um, unpack here. And that's the, that is the, the ratio of how much the state pays versus how much employees pay is one that we would like to get in a, on a more sustainable path. And so for folks on the radio, um, in 2016, the teacher contribution was 28 million and the state contribution was 84 million. And then in 2020, just five years later, we have the teacher contribution at 37 million, which is a really like steady curve upward. And then the state contribution is 188 million. And so those are very different ratios um, over just five years. And it's, I think it's visualizable. And I hope that um, folks who are on the radio can sort of see those really big jumps in numbers from the 84 million state contribution in 2016 to the 188 million in 2020. So just a, a before we go to break, just a quick clarifying question uh, for, for my education. How much do things like cost of living or inflation or anything like that kind of factor into the numbers we just looked at? Well, that's where you would normally expect to see that, that gradual, slow, steady increase, like you're seeing a, a gradual increase in what uh, the teachers and state employees are contributing. Um, and, and so you want to build a system that accounts for that, you know, that, that recognizes that it's going to cost a little bit more in the future than it does right now. Um, but those large jumps um, are really not so much about uh, cost of living adjustments as they are about uh, missed assumptions. Thank you very much. The Montpelier Happy Hour on WVEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro will return in a moment. Welcome back to the second half of the Montpelier Happy Hour here on WBW 107.7 LP Brattleboro, your community radio station. I'm your host, Olga Peters, and if you are just joining us, I'm speaking with Representative Emily Kornheiser and Representative Sarah Copeland Hansas. Um, and we are talking about t uh, state pension system. Emily, I want to kind of punt it to you and talk about, you know, we, we've talked about some of what got us to this point, to needing to look at the state pension system. But um, there's been a lot of conversations around that. Uh, so I know you have some thoughts and feelings you would like to share about some of the conversations that have. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to spend some time unpacking the sort of both the deeply human side of this and the politics side of that, this and how they interact. So one thing that um, we were talking about over the break, which I think is very, very relevant is, and this is a very recurring Montpelier and perhaps a really recurring governance problem. Mm -hmm. We um, didn't really take the time to make sure that everyone understood the problem before we sought to solve it or to introduce a solution. And so that's true in terms of making sure that folks who receive pensions or are going to receive pensions in the future understood the problem. That's true um, for all of our colleagues in the legislature, many of whom are new or in new roles, making sure that they understood the problem and the scale of the problem and the shape and the texture and the flavor of the problem. Um, and that's true with sort of the broader Vermont public. And it's, you know, not the sexiest of problems by any means, which is part of the reason that people don't understand it, but it's also just that, you know, people change. And the folks who are in the legislature this year are not the same folks that were in the legislature last year. And so really taking the time to make sure everyone's on the same page about the problem we're solving before we um, 
come up with brilliant solutions that we introduce, um, I think is really, really important and really hard to do via Zoom, um, along with everything else that's very hard to do via Zoom. So and, that's the biggest one for me. Yeah, and sort of the human side of that is that, you know, our teachers have just hit the one year anniversary <sighs> of the most disruptive and the most difficult years of their lives. And it, and it is a, it, there, there's no exaggeration that I could make that would help someone who has never been a classroom teacher understand what it feels like to go home on a Friday, to be told that you're not going back to in-person learning, but oh, by the way, we got to figure out how to do this over the computer or online, you know, in places where internet is spotty, um, you know, teachers sitting in the parking lot in their car at school because they don't have internet at home that's capable of, uh, of doing what they need to do. I mean, an incredible amount of ingenuity and adaptation uh, was put into uh, basically standing our schools on their head and turning them into virtual learning uh, institutions overnight. And the, to maintain that pace of work for teachers for the last year has been exhausting. And so it is no wonder that they were not uh, ready to or able to really engage in the magnitude of this problem because, no. you know, like, okay, pension, that's like, that's something I'm going to deal with in 10 or 20 or 30 years. But right now, Jimmy doesn't have internet at home and, and, Christy, you know, lives in an abusive home and, uh, and doesn't have anybody to help her get online so that she can do her lessons for the day. I mean, it's just real human um, challenges that, that these teachers were, were having to work through. And, and then state yeah, employee. State employee yeah. Yeah, many of them, uh, you know, had to go from going to the office every day to now doing their job from their kitchen table or from their dining room with their children along next to them, uh, you know, trying to trying to multitask. I mean, being a, a parent and a teacher at the same time <laughs> because you have your children home with you working remotely is uh is very challenging and i've also yeah. talked to a lot of state employees who you know most of the staff of the department of health had to drop their entire you know previous job descriptions to jump into like deep covid response you know um i know Job's someone who was like and... did substance use coalition building and is now doing testing um mm -hmm you know, and contact tracing. There are folks who still have like deep field work jobs that are, um, had to, you know, come in contact with some really vulnerable populations that probably weren't masking. So we really, you know, and when you work in state government, you, um, similar to when you're serving in state government, you really bear the brunt of people's stress on any given day. So it's no wonder that this was not a problem that people were able to really grasp and spend time thinking about. Mm -hmm. And so it begs the question, what were we thinking um, that we thought that this was the year to do this? And so I think it's really important to name that too, because um, in retrospect, you know, it's not in retrospect that we realized that the timing was terrible for the folks that we were engaging this conversation with. Um, but there's also some things that happened this year that made it seem like this was the year that we really had a great, much greater opportunity to be getting yes. this done. And so I think we should talk about that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, there's both the opportunity of now and then looming on the horizon there, you know, there's a, a great big worry about what's coming next for the uh, fiscal security of the state of Vermont. Um, and so, uh, you know, what's, what's the opportunity of now really was that with all of the, uh, you know, PPP money and all of the COVID relief money circulating around in the Vermont economy, we had better than expected tax revenues this year. Um, you know, a year ago when we closed up shop in Montpelier and we all came home to our dining rooms to work remotely, uh, we thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be terrible. Businesses are going to close and nobody's going to you know, have any money to do anything. And then lo and behold, the federal 
money came through and the COVID relief grants have been able to help, uh, help stem some of that bleeding and in fact gave us a surprise um, bump in our state revenue. And the, some of the COVID relief money has been useful in that it's covering things that, that we have to do as a state and it's covering uh, costs that might otherwise have come out of the general fund. And so between the increased revenues and the COVID relief money that's helping the state of Vermont, the, the speaker was able to put together $150 million. And she said, you know, use this money coupled with some governance changes and benefits changes and try to get the pensions on a path towards sustainability. So that, that $150 million, um, while it's a small drop in the bucket, if you look at the total liability that ranges in the billions, um, unfathom, unfathomable numbers really, um, is gonna be very helpful in, in getting us on the right path uh, towards sustainability. And for people who don't have a sort of the scale of our usual budgets, like that is an absolute amount of flexibility that we don't ever have in our budget. I mean, that is a huge amount of money by Vermont standards. It's not a lot by, you know, really almost any other state standards, but it's a huge amount of money by Vermont standards. And so us having that flexibility this year was huge to be able to put that into the hopper of how to come out the other side of this challenge. Another thing that for me was really important is that we had a speaker who came up in her political and um, professional life as like deeply partnered with unions and often working for unions and with unions. And so I felt like having, for me, having a leader at the helm who really understood the needs of unions, believes deeply in workers' rights and in union solidarity made um, me trust in the process in a way that I think would have been more challenging for me with a different speaker um, who might have been a solid Democrat, but might not have really understood unions as well as the speaker did. And so I think that's another important part that she really believed deeply that this is how we are going to save our pension system and we are saving our pension system so that we can continue to have defined benefit plans into the future. Um, and so that's another sort of why now piece of the puzzle. And then I think the other side of it that is worthwhile for people to understand, um, because this side of it's not going away. Um, we still, you know, this is this is part of the reason why um, we are going to need to expect that this task force will recommend, a, a, you know, a long term solution is, you know, in a year, in a year and a half when all of this COVID stimulus money is, has been spent and is no longer circulating around in our Vermont economy, bumping up our tax revenues and, and helping to sustain people uh, the way the unemployment insurance has, the way the PPP has, the COVID emergency relief grants have, um, we could be looking at a really significant recession in the state of Vermont. And if and when, uh, we are looking at a significant recession like that. If we have not put that, that uh, pension uh, liability growth somewhere in check so that it is leveling off, so that it is a manageable, more like the rate of inflation uh, increase instead of jumping by a hundred million dollars um, at a time, <laughs> uh, we could be in a situation where where we no longer are able to uh, to to continue to fund the the pension system as we view it now, and then the threat becomes uh, that that we look at doing far more drastic uh, cuts to this benefit that that our teachers and our state employees um, should rightly have. Hmm. Yeah, that and is are, sobering information, isn't it? It really is. I mean, it's, you know, I think that many of us who ran for office in the fall, um, who had been, you know, already doing this, really imagined coming back into perhaps the hardest two years of our legislative 
careers and perhaps lives. And not just because legislating over Zoom is really difficult, but because I think before all the federal money came in, we were imagining like really reckoning with some significant cuts or significant tax increases or a combination of the two, but really some tough decisions. And instead we're operating this um, real arena of abundance while having a knowledge that um, this might not likely won't go on forever, that there's going to be a tail. And it might be a tail with a big drop. It might be a tail with a slow drop, but um, there's going to be some tail on the other side of this. And we want to be setting up policy while we feel flush um, to be ready for that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, um, I don't think that's about, I think it's about making this, you know, we talk a lot about scarcity mindset on the show. Yeah. Um, and so I think for me, it's that while we, while we are, um, full, we're making those tough decisions from a place of bounty rather than having to wait until we're in a place of um, less and having to make the decisions from there. And so less of sort of making these decisions now from fear of the future, but making these decisions now while it feels possible to use, you know, money to um, pad, pad some challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Emily. Well, I, I think that is a very strong point with Vermont's scarcity mindset, because that is another thing that, again, as I, as I sit on the outside looking in at this situation, that I hear raised a lot, like, well, why do those, those teachers and state employees, they already got it good, so why do they need pensions or, or that sort of comment. And um, I just want to highlight how dangerous I feel the scarcity mindset for Vermont has become, because I think to a certain extent we've adopted as a way of living. And for many people, it's a point of pride to be able to do so much with so little. But we've, we're kind of reaching a point, at least in my non-economically trained viewpoint that we are running into these these issues like the pension system that we're really creating very deep binds for ourselves um, rather than as Emily said operating from a place of abundance and finding solutions and possibility um, so I'm just throwing that out there for people for listeners to kind of keep in the back of their their head as they consider this this issue um, One of the dynamics of that that I think really enters into this conversation as it becomes a pub, more and more public conversation is the majority of Vermonters don't have pensions. Right. The Vermar majority of legislators don't have pensions. The majority of Americans don't have pensions. Um, and, you know, most Vermonters and certainly most Americans don't really have any money saved for retirement at all. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's a big temptation in the public eye to say, well, I don't have that. Why should th they have that? Um, and so I think it's really important as we're talking about changes to also talking about to also talk about the profound value of um, you know a strong middle class of um, making sure that aging populations have the financial resources that they need of um, how these systems really help people stay in jobs through very very difficult years. I could never be a teacher. I, you know, when I visited my son's school, I would often want to hide under the table because I was so overwhelmed. So I just, you know, the value of these systems for not just the people who receive pensions from them, but for all the rest of us and what we're able to gain as communities as a state from these pension systems is a really important part of this conversation as well. And I think um, I'm nervous that as the conversation becomes larger and larger, and moves outside of a conversation between just the unions and the legislature and into the more broad public eye that we're going to start to hear um, much more anti-union, anti-pension pushback. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, um, I hope we can take that broader view when we have those conversations. Yeah. 
a uh, very good point. Thank you, Emily. Well, and, and the flip side is in, maybe instead of saying, I don't have a pension, why do they need one? The question is, why don't I have a pension? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't um, that be the right question to ask? <laughs> you know, this, is, this should not be a race to the bottom. It actually should be a, how do we make sure that everyone has the security to live a dignified life into retirement and beyond? Mm hmm Yeah. So for, for you, Sarah, and your, your committee, you've been charged with moving forward. What are your kind of next immediate steps? Oh, that's so good that you asked that because this is a perfect time to pivot to, uh, to what are we actually doing? Um, we heard a proposal last week from uh, a, a collaboration between the chair of the Pension Investment Committee this is the committee who makes the decisions about how the pension funds uh, get invested so that we can try to maximize our returns on investment. Uh, so the, the treasurer and the chair of VPIC, Vermont Pension Investment Committee, um, got together and, uh, and then they proposed a, a change in the governance structure that will, um, that will try to infuse some more of what we've seen as sort of best practices out across pension uh, systems around the country um, on who should sit on these governing bodies, these bodies who are making all the decisions about our public employees' pensions. And um, the proposal that they made is not earth shattering. It works within sort of the system that we have right now, but it's going to, uh, it's going to make sure that there are people who have a little bit more expertise um, uh, and and who are charged with much more transparency so that we as legislators who don't sit on those committees and, uh, and teachers and state employees as benefits of those systems, beneficiaries of those systems will be able to understand how well the pension system is, uh, is operating. So we need to have more communication, more transparency, a dashboard almost, you know, so that we can check, you know, periodically and say, hey, you know, looks like things are going well, thank you very much, um, you know, we'll get out of your way, instead of, you know, looming at, you know, diving off a cliff every 10 years and having to do some, uh, you know, some sort of drastic changes. So that governance proposal was put on the table late last week. Um, the committee, uh, the Government Operations Committee has a great deal of experience in um, in sort of looking at how boards and commissions and, and such are uh, set up, we've, all, we've been looking for weeks at what some of the best practices are for governance from around the country. And so I feel pretty confident that we'll be able to arrive at a place where we're going to move some of those governance changes now. The one lingering question that probably we won't make a decision on now is the question of whether that pension investment committee should be completely independent entity with no, um, with no direct ties to state government at all. Currently right now they're, they're, uh, they're housed in the treasurer's office and it is the treasurer's staff who, uh, who help the, the VPIC perform their functions. Um, and so they're gonna study uh, whether they think they should move to full independence where they have the, the control over hiring staff and, and making all those decisions. That, that I think we can wait um, for them to report back to us on, but there are a few things that we know need to be done. And then we also need to set up a, a task force, some sort of interim process where, where we can have that full um, conversation around the table that we were unable to have. Uh, I think the, the, the problem has been highlighted and people are now tuned in to understand what the challenge is. Um, and so we need this task force to then sit down between um, legislators, uh, some members of the administration and union representatives to sit down and take a look at that, that what I said was a, a math problem. You know, are our benefits and the employee employer contributions set right to put, our, to put this on a sustainable path? And uh, so that's going to be the job of the task force that we will create um, in the Government Operations Committee. Just, you know, it'll, it'll pass out as a bill 
with those governance changes with this task force. Um, and then that bill will go over to the Senate where it'll be considered there and, um, and ultimately will go to the governor's desk for a signature. And uh, so the task force is going to be a long process, you know, and I'm hopeful that it's a process that can happen uh, as, pe as more and more people get vaccinated that can actually happen in person because mm -hmm. there's so much more that's possible in terms of uh, shared values and uh, shared sacrifice that we can do when we're all sitting physically in the same room. And you mentioned uh, this passing out of your committee as a bill and going to the Senate. Do you think that will happen this session or do you think it will actually happen uh, next year? I think the governance changes are critical enough that we have to move those now. We have to ask the governing boards whose responsibility it is to manage the pension system to adopt these best practices. And that is, that is urgent. And, 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 it, and it is also largely consensus. Uh, people get it that, uh, that we, we've been going off the rails for a while and, and we, should have, uh, we should have been able to catch this sooner. Um, and so the governance has to happen. And, and the Speaker of the House has given us a very clear directive you know, she does not want this to get swept under the rug and ignored such that in two years, you know, if we're in the middle of a, of a recession, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, consensus that we should discontinue the defined benefit that we offer to our public employees. And, and I think she's right. I think we really have to, to do this hard work now so that if and when we hit a recession, uh, we're not looking at making critical changes in, the, in those benefits. Thank you, Sarah. Emily, what would you like to add before? Um, I think that the governance changes can seem really abstract to people. And so I wanna highlight that transparency piece of the governance changes. And um, I was a state employee for a short time. I still have, um, but it was recent enough that I still have money sort of in the investment pot. And my partner does as well. And we, um, along with many other state employees or former state employees, get a um, little letter, and Sarah's heard me say this before, um, and I'm sure she's had the letter described to her in many a public hearing. You get this little letter um, every year, and it's a different font than other mail from the state. It's like a fancier font. It feels like a certificate. Um, and you know, like when you were in elementary school and you got a certificate because you won a thing and like that special feeling, it really like harkens up all those feelings. It's this very fancy certificate and it's even folded differently than regular mail. And inside it, it tells you how much money you have in the retirement system um, and how much your benefit's gonna be when you retire. And you know, you see the number grow every year and it, people look forward to it coming. And it's like this little, like this little magic pot envelope. So that information that's like so um, central for folks in their careers should also include what the liability is. <laughs> um, because it's not just your little, because no one's little magic retirement fund sits all by itself inside the little envelope. It's part of a much larger system. And so I think that there's real things we can do around governance that will help people get their head around the fact that that larger system, the retirement system and what VPIC does and the full fund is theirs too. And so I'm really hopeful that as we have these kinds of conversations, we can really much better get our heads around the fact that this is everyone's responsibility to pay attention to and to coddle and love and get excited about and to yell at when it's not doing well. Um, but that I think there's a lot we can do around, you know, Sarah said a dashboard. I'm really hopeful that little letter can have some new information on it that will help people think about sort of the collective retirement good and not just their individual retirement good. Wonderful. Thank you. We are unfortunately out of time, even though this is such a, a deep conversation. So I want to thank Sarah for being on the show today. And Emily, thank you for, for your insight. 
The Montpelier Happy Hour is airs at 2 p.m. every Friday on WBEW 107.7 LP Brattleboro. You can also find us on the Montpelier Happy Hour Facebook page as well as the Montpelier Happy Hour .captivate.fm. That is our podcast website. And Emily, if people want to reach out to you, how can they do that? Folks can go to emilykornheiser.org where you can find links to my Facebook and Twitter and social medias and email and phone number, as well as a link to my weekly community conversations every Saturday at 11 via Zoom. And Sarah, if people want to reach out to you. My contact information is on the legislative directory and uh, I have a phone number and email address there. Um, you can find me on social media as well. Uh, if you just look for Rep. Sarah Copeland Hansis. Thank you so much. Hey, have a great weekend, everyone. And thanks for joining us today.